Well, welcome again to another podcast, Down to Earth, but Heavenly Minded. I'm your host, Irv Risch. And as we move forward, we're going to be going through the entire New Testament. Uh, and with that, we're going to do a commentary afterwards. And uh, with that said, let us just move on to our next section. And thank you for joining me. Chapter 10. And he left there and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan, and crowds gathered to him again, and again, as was his custom, he taught them. And Pharisees came up and, in order to test him, asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And in the house the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands, with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him 
and spit on him, and flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Mark chapter 10 G. A marriage and divorce, 10 colon 1, 12 10 colon 1 from Galilee our Lord traveled southeastward to Perea, the district on the east side of the Jordaniel his Perean ministry extends through 1045. 10 colon 2 the Pharisees soon found him. They were moving in for the kill, like a pack of wolves. In an effort to trap him, they asked him if divorce was lawful. He referred them back to the Pentateuch. What did Moses command? 10 colon 3, 9 They avoided his question by stating what Moses permitted. He permitted a man to divorce his wife, provided he gave her a written certificate of divorce. But that was not God's ideal, it was permitted only because of the hardness of the people's hearts. The divine plan joined a man and woman in marriage as long as they live. This goes back to God's creation of the sexes. A man is to leave his parents and be so united in marriage that he and his wife are one flesh. Thus joined by God, they should not be separated by human decree. 1010 Apparently, this was difficult for even his disciples to accept. At that time, women did not have a place of honor or security. They were often treated with little more than contempt. A man could divorce his wife if he was displeased with her. She had no recourse. In many cases, she was treated as a piece of property. 10 11, 12 When the disciples questioned the Lord further, he said pointedly that remarriage after divorce was adultery, whether the man or the woman got the divorce. Taken by itself, this verse would indicate that divorce is forbidden under all circumstances. But in Matthew 19 verse 9, he made an exception. Where one partner has been guilty of immorality, the other is permitted to get a divorce and is presumably free to remarry. It is also possible that 1 Corinthians 7 verse 15 permits divorce when an unbelieving partner deserts a Christian spouse. Assuredly there are difficulties connected with the whole subject of divorce and remarriage. People create marital tangles so involved that it takes the wisdom of a Solomon to extricate them. 
The best way to avoid these tangles is to avoid divorce. Divorce places a cloud and a question mark over the lives of those involved. When divorced persons seek fellowship in a local church, the elders must review the case in the fear of God. Every case is different and must be considered individually. This paragraph shows Christ's concern not only for the sanctity of marriage, but also for the rights of women. Christianity gives to women a standing in honor not found in other religions. H. Blessing the Little Children, 10 colon 13 o 16. 10 13 Now we see the solicitude of the Lord Jesus for little children. Parents who brought their children to be blessed by the teacher shepherd were shooed away by the disciples. 10 colon 14 at 16 The Lord was greatly displeased and explained that the kingdom of God belongs to little children and to those who have childlike faith and humility. Adults have to become like small children in order to enter the kingdom. George MacDonald used to say that he did not believe in a man's Christianity if boys and girls were never to be found playing around his door. Certainly these verses should impress the servant of the Lord with the importance of reaching little ones with the word of God. The minds of children are most plastic and most receptive. W. Graham Scroggie said, Be your best and give your best to the children. I of the rich young ruler, 10 colon 17, 31. 10.17 a.m. Rich man intercepted the Lord with an apparently sincere inquiry. Addressing Jesus as good teacher, he asked what he had to do to inherit eternal life. 10.18 Jesus seized on the words good teacher. He did not refuse the title but used it to test the man's faith. Only God is good. Was the rich man willing to confess the Lord Jesus as God? Apparently not. 1019, 20 next the Savior used the law to produce the knowledge of sin. The man was still under the delusion that he could inherit the kingdom on the principle of doing. Then let him obey the law, which told him what to do. Our Lord quoted the five commandments which deal primarily with our relations to our fellow man. These five commandments say, in effect, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The man professed to have kept them from his youth. 1021, 22 But did he really love his neighbor as himself? If so, let him prove it by selling all his property and giving the money to the poor. Oh, that was another story. He went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. The Lord Jesus did not mean that this man could have been saved by selling his possessions and giving the proceeds to charity. There is only one way of salvation that is faith in the Lord. But in order to be saved a man must acknowledge that he is a sinner, falling short of God's holy requirements. The Lord took the man back to the Ten Commandments to produce conviction of sin. The rich man's unwillingness to share his possessions showed that he did not love his neighbor as himself. He should have said, Lord, if that's what is required, then I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself by my own efforts. Therefore, I ask you to save me by your grace. But he loved his property too much. He was unwilling to give it up. He refused to break. When Jesus told the man to sell all, he was not giving this as the way of salvation. He was showing the man that he had broken the law of God and therefore needed to be saved. If he had responded to the Savior's instruction, he would have been given the way of salvation. But there is a problem here. Are we who are believers supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves? Does Jesus say to us, sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me? Each one must answer for himself, but before doing so, he should consider the following inescapable facts. 1. Thousands of people die daily of starvation. 2. More than half the world has never heard the good news. 3. Our material possessions can be used now to alleviate spiritual and physical human need. For, the example of Christ teaches us that we should become poor that others might be made rich, 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. 5. The shortness of life and the imminence of the Lord's coming teach us to put our money to work for Him now. After He comes it will be too late. 10 colon 23, 25 As He saw the rich man fade into the crowd, Jesus remarked on the difficulty of rich people entering the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed by this remark they linked riches with the blessing of God. So Jesus repeated, Children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. 
In fact, he continued, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. 1026, 27 This made the disciples wonder who then can be saved. As Jews living under the law, they correctly looked on riches as an indication of God's blessing. Under the Mosaic Code, God promised prosperity to those who obeyed Him. The disciples reasoned that if a rich person couldn't enter the kingdom, then no one else could either. Jesus answered that what is humanly impossible is divinely possible. What are we to conclude from the teaching of this passage? First of all, it is especially difficult for rich people to be saved, verse 23, since these people tend to love their wealth more than God. They would rather give up God than give up their money. They put their trust in riches rather than in the Lord. As long as these conditions exist, they cannot be saved. It was true in the OT that riches were a sign of God's favor. That is now changed. Instead of a mark of the Lord's blessing, riches are a test of a man's devotedness. A camel can go through a needle's eye more easily than a rich man can go through the door of the kingdom. Humanly speaking, a rich man simply cannot be saved. Someone may object here that humanly speaking, no one can be saved. That is true. But it is even more true in the case of a rich man. He faces obstacles that the poor man isn't aware of. The God of Mammon must be torn from the throne of his heart, and he must stand before God as a pauper. To effect this change is humanly impossible. Only God can do it. Christians who lay up treasures on earth generally pay for their disobedience in the lives of their children. Very few children from such families go on well for the Lord. 10 28, 30 Peter caught the drift of the Savior's teaching. He realized that Jesus was saying, Forsake all and follow me. Jesus confirmed this by promising present and eternal reward to those who forsake all for his sake and the Gospels. 1. The present reward is 10,000% return, not in money, but in a house's homes of other people where he is given accommodations as a servant of the Lord. Be brothers and sisters and mothers and children, Christian friends whose fellowship enriches all of life. See lands, countries of the world which he has claimed for the king. D. Persecutions, these are a part of the present reward. It is a cause of rejoicing when one is found worthy to suffer for Jesus' sake. 2. The future reward is eternal life. This does not mean that we earn eternal life through forsaking all. Eternal life is a gift. Here the thought is that those who forsake all are rewarded with a greater capacity for enjoying eternal life in heaven. All believers will have that life, but not all will enjoy it to the same extent. 1031 Then our Lord added a word of warning, many who are first will be last, and the last first. It isn't enough to start out well on the path of discipleship. It's how we finish that counts. Ironside said. Not everyone who gave promise of being a faithful and devoted follower would continue in the path of self-denial for Christ's namesake, and some who seemed backward and whose devotedness was questionable would prove real and self-effacing in the hour of trial. Point 19. J. Third Prediction of the Servant's Passion, 1032-34 1032 The time had now come to go up to Jerusalem. For the Lord Jesus this meant the sorrow and suffering of Gethsemane, the shame and agony of the cross. What were his emotions at such a time? Can we not read them in the words Jesus was going before them? There was determination to do God's will, knowing fully what the cost would be. There was loneliness, he was out ahead of the disciples, walking alone. And there was joy, a deep, settled joy of being in the Father's will, a joyful prospect of coming glory, the joy of redeeming a bride to himself. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. As we gaze upon him, striding in the vanguard, we too are amazed. Our intrepid leader, the author and finisher of our faith, our glorious master, Prince Divine. Erdman writes. Let us pause to gaze on that face and form, the Son of God, going with unfaltering step toward the cross. Does it not awaken us to new heroism as we follow? Does it not awaken new love as we see how voluntary was his death for us? Yet do we not wonder at the meaning and the mystery of that death? Those who followed were afraid. They knew that the religious leaders in Jerusalem were bent on his death. 
1033, 34 For the third time Jesus gave his disciples a detailed account of coming events. This prophetic outline shows him to be more than a mere man. 1. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, 11 colon 1, 13 and 37. 2. The Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and scribes, 14 colon 1, 2, 43 to 53. 3. They will condemn him to death, 14 colon 55, 65. 4. And deliver him to the Gentiles, 15 colon 1. 5. They will mock him, and scourge him, and spit on him, and kill him, 15 colon 2, 38. 6. And the third day he will rise again, 16 colon 1, 11. Cade greatness is serving, 1035 or 45. 1035, 37 Following this poignant prediction of his approaching crucifixion, James and John came with a request that was at once noble and ill-timed. It was noble that they wanted to be near Christ, but it was a poor time to be seeking great things for themselves. They exhibited faith that Jesus would set up his kingdom, but they should have been thinking of his impending passion. 1038, 39 Jesus asked them if they were able to drink his cup, referring to his suffering, and share his baptism, referring to his death. They professed to be able, and he said they were right. They would suffer because of their loyalty to him, and James at least would be martyred, Acts 12 verse 2. 1040 But then he explained that positions of honor in the kingdom were not bestowed arbitrarily. They would be earned. It is good to remember here that admission to the kingdom is by grace through faith, but position in the kingdom will be determined by faithfulness to Christ. 10 colon 41 44 The other ten disciples were greatly displeased that James and John would try to get ahead of them. But their indignation betrayed the fact that they had the same spirit. This provided the occasion for the Lord Jesus to give a beautiful and revolutionary lesson on greatness. Among the unconverted, great men are those who rule with arbitrary power, who are overbearing and domineering. But greatness in Christ's kingdom is marked by service. Whoever desires to be first should become a slave to everyone. 1045 The supreme example is the Son of Man himself. He did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Think of it. He came at his miraculous birth. He ministered throughout his life. And in his vicarious death he gave his life. As mentioned before, verse 45 is the key verse of the entire gospel. It is a theology in miniature, a vignette of the greatest life the world has ever known. L of the healing of blind Bartimaeus, 10 colon 46, 52. 1046 The scene now shifts from Perea to Judea. The Lord and his disciples had crossed the Jordan and come to Jericho. There he met blind Bartimaeus, a man with a desperate need, a knowledge of the need, and a determination to have it met. 1047 Bartimaeus recognized and addressed our Lord as the son of David. It was ironical that while the nation of Israel was blind to the presence of the Messiah, a blind Jew had true spiritual sight. 10 colon 48, 52 His persistent pleas for mercy did not go unanswered. His specific prayer for sight brought a specific answer. His gratitude was expressed in faithful discipleship, following Jesus on his last trip to Jerusalem. It must have cheered the heart of the Lord to find faith like this in Jericho as he moved on toward the cross. It was a good thing that Bartimaeus sought the Lord that day because the Savior never passed that way again. Well, this ends another one of our podcasts, and uh, until next time, just remember, God is out here, and you can find out all about him in your Bibles. All you have to do is pick it up and read it. I have mine right here, and uh, God is in this Bible, so please read it. With that said, bye for now. Till next time.